when you get in this business of healing, you're just going to have to knuckle down and know that this is going to be, I'm going to have to do this for the long haul. And this is going to have to be a lifelong process, similar to uh, wanting to get in shape. You don't go to the gym for three months and go, oh, well, I'm finally lost some fat and gained some muscle. I'm good to go. And then you just go back to where you were again. No, you have to view going to the gym and eating properly uh, as a lifelong, as, as a lifestyle. And so this business of staying, staying in recovery is a lifestyle. It's not a once you, you, you never arrive, Margaret, right? You just never arrive. You're always a work in progress and you got to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. everyone, I'm Margot Alexis. Welcome to the Healing Cassandra podcast. My guest today is Mark Hutton. Mark is a practicing counseling psychologist with more than 25 years experience. He has worked with hundreds of children and teens with autism. He also helps couples affected by autism spectrum disorder through private counseling, weekly group meetings, and workshops. Mark is a prolific author of many articles, blogs, and eBooks. But you may best know Mark from his vast library of videos on his YouTube channel. Today, Mark and I have a conversation about Cassandra syndrome. We talk about what it is, and Mark offers insights and practical advice on how to begin your healing journey. I hope you find a few good takeaways. Enjoy. Thank you for joining me, Mark. So happy that you could be part of today's podcast. I'm tickled to death to be here. I thought we would start out with um, you giving us a definition of what is Cassandra syndrome. There's a lot of um, mixed, there's, there's a mixed bag on exactly what that means. Uh, some people uh, think that it has to do with uh, not being able to uh, describe your dilemma without people just disbelieving you. And then there's another kind of the, the definition of Cassandra syndrome has really uh, widened, we will say. And so now it's kind of uh, almost similar to emotional deprivation in a sense. Um, so it's kind of a, a mixed bag, the definition, and everybody seems to have their own pet definition. But mine is, what you're asking me, is um, it's basically a lack of, we would just call it adequate psycho, psychological nurturance from your significant other. You know, when you, you hook up sounds like a sarcastic term, but when you hook up with somebody and, and you expect to be hooked up in the sense that there's going to be, uh, you're going to be soulmates, you're going to be team players, you're going to be uh, on the same page with give and take in conversation and sharing feelings. So the whole premise of, of dating, getting married, the whole business has to do with psychological nurturance where uh, we are social creatures by nature. And so we need people, but we are also a species who needs a specific person. And so if you are with somebody who, for example, on the autism spectrum, and it wouldn't necessarily have to just be ASD. It could be other uh, mental disorders as well. For example, maybe bipolar. Some of this might occur in that scenario as well. But in essence, emotional neglect is a failure of the, in this case, we're talking about autism spectrum disorder level one, to respond to your emotional needs and he's not necessarily doing this intentionally. In fact, I will go on record as saying this, quote, emotional neglect, unquote, is largely unintentional, but that doesn't change anything because it still hurts. Emotional neglect is the result of your ASD partner uh, failing to respond to your emotional needs, which results, uh, I'm sorry, which occurs because of his traits of the disorder, specifically alexithymia, which is emotions blindness, and mind blindness and uh, this neglect, if we want to call that, well, I guess a good term might be unintentional neglect, does have long-term consequences as well as short-term um, and sometimes almost immediate ones. 
So um, it occurs when your spouse has what we call low emotional empathic quotient, low emotional empathic quotient, which is just a fancy term for emotions blindness. So in other words, the neurotypical wife frequently finds that her autistic partner is often unable to fully engage with her feelings and his own feelings. So um, the guy on the spectrum is low in social and emotional intelligence and also low in social and emotional needs. We could say that your partner with ASD or husband in this case perhaps is psychologically stunted. In other words, his social emotional age is significantly younger than his chronological age. And so uh, the effects of this chronic long lasting, uh, we would just call it affectional neglect perhaps, uh, has devastating consequences, especially for females who are just neurotypical people in general, neurotypical females in general are more socially oriented and even neurotypical, neurotypical males are more task oriented, but that whole dynamic gets graduated and exaggerated in a neurodiverse marriage where the guy on the spectrum is severely task oriented. And so uh, what, ends up, what ends up happening is the marriage fails to thrive and it takes on a different trajectory than the uh, usual uh, growth that a neurotypical marriage uh, paths. You said a lot in there. And I know, you know, women are built for uh, connection and intimacy, and we are expecting that from our partners. And it's also been built up since we were young. I owned a bridal salon and I would see women coming in with the fantasy of their wedding and what marriage would be like. So there is an expectation on the part of the woman of what that marriage is going to look like and the reciprocity. And um, when it doesn't pan out the way they thought it would, then that can lead to bitterness and resentment. But I did like what you said um, that on the part of the husband, it's often unintentional. And I have a funny story, well, maybe not so funny, but very telling to share with you about the different communication styles and expectations that you know my husband and I uh, have in the relationship. My husband is a Trekkie. He, we were talking about um, our, our communication and I felt the lack of you know, intimacy. And my husband who's a Trekkie said, well, I like the way Spock communicates. He's very calm, very logical, and he's not gonna BS you. And I said, oh, now I see the problem because you're modeling your communication after a Vulcan from another galaxy. And I'm modeling, I'm, my expectations are Ryan Reynolds from The Notebook. So there is such a huge difference in that. Can you speak to how would we ever merge those uh, into having a healthy relationship when those expectations are so very different? This is kind of a gross oversimplification of ASD. And we're talking about level one, really, in this case, which is high function autism. Um, these guys are largely task oriented. Um, they're more concerned with objects, facts, figures <clears throat> than they are people. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying they're, they they're, they're can't be social. I'm not saying they don't have any uh, social intelligence or that they don't have any uh, empathy. They, they may not have much in the way of displayed empathy, but they have a lot of empathy too. But they're mostly involved with things, tasks, objects. <clears throat> now, you take the NT wife, of course, she can be task oriented when she needs to be. Of course, she can be logical when she needs to be, but she is more socially oriented and not so much uh, object or task oriented. So that sets up a huge dilemma as you can well imagine. So either one person is gonna to have to change radically, which that never happens. She's never gonna just shove her emotions under the rug and go, okay, well, I'll just try to be analytical and logical and underly emotional and, and shove my uh, needs for emotional reciprocity and empathy aside and I'll just try to be like a Mr. Spock. <clears throat> That's not gonna happen. E even if she wanted to do that, I don't think she would be capable. He is not gonna go, okay, well, 
uh, I'll just go get some surgery done on my uh, a social emotional brain and see if I can rewire myself such that I can uh, match you with your social and emotional skills. That's never going to happen. So this is a very simplified, overgeneralized answer to, to really detail this, uh, to really answer this question in great detail would take probably uh, a book. So what we're talking about now is there has to be some kind of a compromise. She is going to either continue to be miserable with what I would call unreasonable expectations. It's not unreasonable if your husband was neurotypical. <clears throat> and I'm not saying you shouldn't have expectations, but if she doesn't realize what she's dealing with in the way of a guy that has low social and emotional intelligence, <clears throat> and doesn't adjust her expectations down a little bit. She's going to continue to be frustrated. Now, that's her adjusting a bit on her end in the form of a compromise. He can do the same thing. You know, social skills can be taught. Um, emotional literacy can be cultivated. So it's not like, well, he's just going to always have this uh, uh, lack of empathy. He's always going to be perceived as selfish, uncaring, insensitive, narcissistic, and so on. There's a lot of things that he can do, not in the self-help area. He's not going to be able to help himself much. But if he can find somebody who has some expertise in autism spectrum disorder, preferably a male who can re relate to another male, he can develop a lot of skills in the social and emotional arena such that he would get a little closer to her expectations um, matching up with uh, at least uh, giving, at least getting her in the ballpark with um, maybe not necessarily total acceptance of things in the marriage, but certainly get to the point where things would be tolerable. So in a nutshell, this was a long way around the bush, bush to get to the nutshell, and that is there's going to have to be a compromise on both ends, or it's not going to work. There's just going to continue to be suffering. She's going to have to reduce her expectations and he's going to have to get busy working with somebody to, to where he can cultivate some social skills, especially as it relates to a significant other, cultivate some emotional literacy, uh, begin to uh, pull away a little bit from such a strong task orientation. Not that you're never going to, you're never going to be able to get him to be just a social butterfly. But if he values the marriage, you can get him to begin the work of emotional reciprocity. And the description of that for him has to be in pictures. It has to be very detailed. It can't be vague. If she says, Margo, for example, uh, if the NT wife says, uh, I need you to be more uh, empathic, he's not going to know what that means. But if she says, OK, if I were to video record you being empathic, you would be saying and, do, and doing these exact things. So now that's very concrete. It's also a visual for him because he thinks in pictures. Her verbal message is going to get lost. But when she starts describing things in very concrete, simple terms in pictures, he will begin to get it. And then now we can begin the business of compromise where she's lowering her expectations a little bit and he's raising his expectations of himself a little bit. But one of the things, Mark, is women that are in these long-term relationships, we get so run down and depressed and lonely, and we just get caught in, I like to call it the rabbit hole or the vacuum, where we don't have the energy to do that. And it just, you know, everything you said sounds great, but boy, it sounds like a lot of work and it sounds weird, like, where do I even start? So I guess my question is, is what is the first step to recovery? And would, would that just begin with us first as women um, to get ourselves healthy and then, you know, add in our husbands? Well, to, to make a first point that really doesn't answer your question, um, this, is, this little message here is directed towards the NT wives who are early and maybe they're not even married yet. They're in a relationship with somebody on the spectrum or they're early in their marriage. The sooner that you can uh, get some intervention, some kind of outside assistance, some kind of therapy, the better. Because the longer this goes on, 
and you can relate to this, Margo, because I know you've been in a long-term relationship. The longer this goes on unresolved, the deeper that resentment becomes and the more she becomes um, mentally and even physically challenged um, and the more she's worn out because she feels like she's doing all the relationship work and she's spreading herself too thin. When you get to the point where the, the bitterness is so strong and you've worked so hard for little return on your investment of time and energy, you don't have the energy to do the things that you need to do. You know, you could give somebody a, a, a strategy, you could give a couple a particular strategy that uh, involves several steps. And honestly, she may just be too exhausted and mentally uh, spent to even use the strategy and if the resentment is deep enough, she may not even have any desire to use the strategy. I ran into that too, where she's not even mentally or physically capable. And even if she were, she's kind of lost interest. She's given up hope. With respect to uh, your question of what would be some of the first things to do, <clears throat> the very first thing to do would be to uh, do a little bit of personal inventory regarding uh, uh, where you're spending where you're spreading yourself too thin. <clears throat> You've tried harder, and I, I can go on record as saying this, you heard it from me, so they can disagree with me if they want, that's fine. <clears throat> she is always the one that works harder than he does. By a long shot. Um, a rough percentage, and this is kind of being very liberal, she easily does 80% of the relationship work to his 20, sometimes it's more like 95 to five. So in a way, I'm not faulting her. She's done the best that she knows how to do. She, her heart was in the right place, but she has created a monster. In other words, she has been willing to take on the lion's share of the relationship work for so long. He just backed off. There was no need for him to work as hard because she does all the relationship work. And so the very, very first thing to do is for the NT wives to do a little personal inventory, where am I uh, taking on too much responsibility? I'm working twice as hard as he is. And the harder I work, the less he works. <clears throat> so a win-win for me would be to start backing off on some of my investment of time and energy on the less important things anyway. And as a natural organic result, hopefully, and in most cases it is, he will start picking up the slack a little bit. <clears throat> so that would be the very first thing, Margo, is personal inventory on where am I over-invested. I think that's a big part, and I know that was for me. I felt for so many years that I was just on autopilot just to get through and, and to get through with the least amount of conflict as possible. And I paid a big price for that, you know, physically, emotionally, and then that eventually catches up to you. There's definitely the mind-body connection. And when your um, cortisol levels stay at, a, at a, uh, a high level on a consistent basis, and you're not finding any kind of um, peace, and the years just, you know, pile up, you do end up, you know, getting sick. and it all feels so overwhelming. And you are so right in talking about the women do 80% of the work. And I see with a lot of women, that's where some of the resentment comes in and they say, why do I have to be the one that does all the work? But if you want to get healthy and you want to change your life, you're the only one that can do that. So it's up to you to, to do the work. Um, I know one of the things that I've been working on is you know, healthy emotional detachment. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that looks like? Yeah, let me talk about what it's not. <clears throat> because uh, when NT wives hear detachment, that sometimes their first thought is, well, that's what he does to me. He detaches to me. And so what, I'm, you're, I'm you're going to tell me just turn around and do the same thing to him? Well, uh, no, uh, you're, the healthy emotional detachment is not you're going to stop caring about him or you're going to stop uh, loving him or you're going to kick him to the curb 
or you're going to uh, investigate separation or divorce, or you're going to uh, lose your grace and mercy and compassion. And no, it's none of that. It ties in what we just talked about a little bit ago, Margo, and that is the business of, of um, not only uh, backing off on overinvestment, but also recognizing what you can and cannot control and detaching from those things that you cannot control. So healthy emotional uh, detachment involves, uh, we will just say letting go of certain expectations in your relationship and accepting that you're, in this case, your autistic husband, uh, you're just kind of accepting him for who he is, not to get him off the hook, he's very much on the hook, and not to explain away his behavior, but to realize that some of these traits that he has, uh, specifically mind blindness, emotions blindness, executive function deficits, and anxiety, appear as if he is being insensitive, uncaring, selfish, narcissistic, even sociopathic. It's understandable because some of his behavior appears as if she's not important to him, as if uh, he's married to his work. So I, I'm not faulting the MTs for viewing some of these traits uh, the way that they do. But I, I also know that if you're going to take these traits personally, you're going to be very miserable. So one of the things to let go of is letting go of your false assumptions based on some of these traits. That's going to take a lot of education on the NT's part. In other words, she's going to have to differentiate what can he do? What can't he do? What will he do? What won't he do? What is he doing, saying, or how is he behaving that is directly related to some traits? And what other things are basically outside of the traits of the disorder? So letting go simply means um, I'm going to stop trying to fix him. Some of these things, quite honestly, are unfixable. And so uh, emotional, healthy emotional detachment is kind of a, a form of emotional boundary setting, which lets you di divert all your energy that you've been pouring into fixing him. You, you now pull a lot of that energy over here to take care of you. Um, it also means moving away from reaching important conclusions based entirely on emotion. It is the opposite of emotional attachment. We could think an emotionally attached person might get into a fight with her husband, and then she might conclude, well, he just doesn't love me. But someone who is emotionally detached in a healthy way might conclude, okay, I think that he would do better if he could. I think he wants to do better. I think his heart's in the right place. He, he wants to make me happy. He just doesn't quite know how to do it. If he had his choice, he would choose to be as emotionally reciprocal as I desire. He just doesn't have the ability to do that. So I'm going to let go of this pipe dream that someday he's going to match my expectations in the, emotionally in the emotional reciprocity department. So <clears throat> don't get confused with this healthy emotional detachment business. It doesn't mean giving up. You know, giving up means I'm just going to throw up my hands in despair. I'm just going to settle for disappointment and pain. That's, that's not what we're talking about. And so, Mark, it's so, it all sounds so overwhelming. And I think what the ladies have to understand and what I've come to understand is that it's all a process. This is not going to happen in a week. It's not going to happen in a month. It may not happen in a year. It, it's a process and it's implementing. And I always say practicing different things, trying different things and not being so hard on yourself. But I know that when I switched the focus from my husband and spent all that energy and emo you know, emotional and physical energy worried about the relationship from that aspect, and I focused on myself, what my needs were, what I valued in life, and replaced all the negative downloads and the negative energy in the relationship with um, positive things for me, finding new interests, finding new friends. And, you know, I was still in the marriage and, you know, we still did things together, but I wasn't invested in all the negative aspects and all the 
the problems in it. They were still there, but I think that uh, when, when you make switch the focus to yourself and you really say to yourself, I'm going to do the work and begin the healing process on myself. For me, I was surprised because when I started working on myself and changing some of my behaviors, naturally the communication and the relationship with my husband got better because I was coming from a better place and I wasn't dependent upon him to be there in ways that it, it's just, you know, he, he wasn't, he doesn't have the capacity to be there in those ways. So I had to find new ways to engage with my husband to figure out if I'm going to stay in this marriage, how could I have a happy marriage? It may not be, you know, like you see in a rom-com or my friend's marriages, but every mar- I realized every marriage is unique. And my marriage, you know, was one of a kind. And, and I had to work within what I was dealt in um, this marriage. You talk about um, the four R's, remove, repair, reframe, and relax. Let's start with remove. And what, what does that mean? Okay. Well, um, I would like to say that remove uh, means just get rid of all the toxic people in your life because, you know, that would be great. But unfortunately, that's not possible. So since you can't remove them, or in this case, we're talking about your husband, unless you're going to get a divorce, <clears throat> which I'm hoping most people listening to this are not shooting for that. You can't get rid of him. So what, what do you have to get rid of? <clears throat> we have to shoot for the next best thing. And that is we have to get rid, we have to get rid of our um, negative reaction to what he says or does. So the first star calls for uh, removing toxic reactions to, in this case, your ASD husband's behavior. What is a toxic reaction? We could say it's one where you're allowing yourself to get sucked into yet another power struggle with him where you're trying to fix him. And then you have to, then he's going to get defensive, right? And he's going to push back. And now you're in this power struggle. So the, the remove business is we want to think in terms of responding in a way that keeps his anxiety to a minimum. I know this kind of makes it the NT wife's work in a sense, but this is more about your healing than his anxiety reduction. <clears throat> if you will not react to him in fix it mode, um, and we could get into great detail about how to do that. <clears throat> then uh, you're going, you have by default stopped reacting in a way that causes a reaction in him. I want to speak to also when we talk about remove, I think it's also important to remove other uh, people in your life that are toxic and they don't serve your best interest. I know I went through um, a whole inventory. And I looked at the people in my life and I looked at whether they were for my greatest and higher good. Were they adding to my life? Because when you're in um, a neurodiverse relationship, there's a lot of difficulties and it's emotionally draining. It's important to have people in your life that don't do the same thing. And I ended up having to really look at, you know, who I allowed in my life because I tended to be a fixer and a helper. And... I found for me that that wasn't the best thing and it wasn't helping my marriage and it was depleting my energy reserves even more. So, you know, I, I eliminated a lot of people in my life and the ones that I didn't completely eliminate, I set boundaries and that I wasn't their savior, you know, because, you know, people would come to me and want me to fix their lives and with a lot of their problems. And, you know, that's not my responsive, you know, responsibility. And that wasn't serving me well, and it wasn't serving my health very well. So I think when we talk about remove, uh, we could also include other friends outside of the marriage, and maybe even some family members, I had to do that as well. If they're not going to be positive and be um, supportive. And, And that's the other thing we spoke to earlier that you know, when you, you are in these relationships, most of our friends and family, they don't understand. They may see us as, you know, being overly dramatic or they don't know what we're talking about because they don't see those traits in our husband. They don't communicate with them in that way. 
So I think it's really important that you find a group of like-minded women. And that's why I started Healing Cassandra, because I see that that works. When I get support from women who are just like me, who have shared experience, um, I can heal, I can work on my healing and I can take action rather, be, rather than being stuck in the, the negative. So the second thing you talk about is repair. What do you mean by repair? Well, you know, people are, are well aware of the fact that if you, for example, uh, break your wrist or whatever, uh, put it in a cast and it will heal itself. If you get a, a cut or a burn, it will heal itself. The body has the innate ability to heal itself, including your heart. Um, we'll use the example of, uh, let's say you lost a, a family member. Maybe, maybe one of your parents died. And of course, it's never going to be the same without them as it was with them. But having said that, um, if you grieve, which will happen naturally, you don't have to think about it or work at it or even know what you're doing. The grief process will occur um, unless you're trying to uh, anesthetize your grief through drugs or alcohol. Um, if you just let things go their natural course, your heart will heal and in a year or two. You'll be moving on with life. Yes, you'll miss your parent. We're using this as an example, but your heart will be healed up and life will be pretty much back to normal. <clears throat> so in the same way that uh, a broken leg can heal itself, a broken heart will heal itself as long as you keep the obstacles out of the way. And there are two main reasons why repair can't be achieved. The first one, which is an obstacle, is the toxic reactions to his behavior, which is what we've referred to a little bit ago. And then the other thing that will keep, uh, that will disrupt the natural healing of the heart <clears throat> would be if you don't replace the former toxic reactions with a new functional, we will call it a functional response. So we're uh, twofold here in order for the heart to take its natural course to heal. We're going to eliminate toxic reactions and we're going to include. Uh, functional responses. Those are two different things. You can't just take one thing out and leave that empty space there. You have to take one thing out, in this case, the toxic reactions, and replace it with something else, which in this case is an intentional and pre-planned response rather than a knee-jerk reaction. If you don't replace the former reaction with a, a new response, then you will, by default, at an unconscious level, revert back to your old habits and the toxic reactions will creep back in again. So that's where you lead to the <clears throat> next step is the reframing. And that, I think, is a very critical part to learn to reframe things. Can you give us an example of, of a reframe? Yeah. So we had talked about removing toxic reactions, including, uh, and we want to include a uh, replacement for that. And the, the replacement for that is the reframe. It's an intentional pre-planned response rather than a knee-jerk reaction. So a, a, a positive reframe is uh, not necessarily put any positive spin or an unrealistic spin on something. And it's certainly not um, just kind of bullshitting yourself and to uh, sugarcoating things. Rather, it is trying to look at the most realistic view of what's really going on. So let's say, for example, your husband says something that's very hurtful to you. Um, then you have the option uh, to have two different types of inner dialogue or self-talk. The first option that many of the NT wives have, have opted for, unfortunately, would be the negative download. And so to use this example where he has said something hurtful, one of her negative downloads or misinterpretations might be he doesn't care about my feelings and he seems to get some kind of payoff for hurting me. So that's the self-talk that leads to a toxic response. We want to replace that with a positive reframe. So in this case, same example, he says something that's hurtful. And so your positive reframe could be Honestly, he doesn't have the emotional intelligence to understand that what he just said was rude and inconsiderate. And I'm not going to get sucked into yet another power struggle and make things worse with a defensive knee-jerk reaction. Um, it wasn't intentional. It still hurts. 
and I'm not uh, liking it any better now than I did before, but at least I'm not going to assign negative motives or malicious intent on his part. One of the things that you said that I, I always go back to that had has really helped me is the analogy is if my husband was blind and I was an artist and I created a beautiful painting and I would take it to my husband and say, look at this beautiful painting, look at the colors and, and look at the brush strokes. And I'm really proud of this. Look how beautiful this is. Well, my husband's blind. He can't see the painting. So am I going to get upset with him? Am I going to say, why can't you see this painting? And you don't understand my creativity and I'm an artist. And, you know, so it's the same with my husband. He has mind blindness. He can't understand um, some of the things that I would expect him to understand, but he just doesn't. So it's, it's wasted energy. It's, it's not um, anything that's, that's important, uh, not important. It's not um, helpful to the situation for me to keep going back to, you know, you should be this way. And that leads to using the word you a lot. I noticed that I'm practicing in the, the reframes and then the communication with my husband. It's really easy to go, you should do this or you. And when you lead with that, it raises his anxiety and they feel defensive because they feel criticized. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's, yeah, that's right on, right on target. Um, you know, it, the NT wife um, is very intuitive. Uh, she's very empathic and maybe even in some cases an empath. And so she never had uh, uh, emotion skills 101 in college. She never had a class in grade school about him. She just intuitively, naturally, organically uh, is skilled in that area. And meaning, so therefore feelings are very meaningful to her. <clears throat> and talking about and expressing feelings, super important to her. And why wouldn't it be? But dealing with him, you have to realize well, there's this thing called alexithymia, which is emotions blindness. And so when she talks to him in terms of feelings, which I'm not faulting her, why wouldn't she? But she's speaking French, especially if she says, um, I feel this way about such and such. And then she expects him to take how she feels and apply it to some course of action he's supposed to take. He's not going to get that. And because he is emotionally blind to that. But she may download that as he doesn't care about my feelings. And then uh, in an attempt to help him understand, she actually makes him misunderstand even more because now his anxiety is up. And when his anxiety is up and she's trying to explain and deliver a good message, he's only going to be able to listen to 80% of what she says and only understand 60% of that and only retain 40% of that. And so she's getting very little payoff on her um, attempt to get him to understand. And when he doesn't understand after her, after she spent a lot of time and energy trying to get him to understand, now she even feels more uh, neglected and discounted. And, and the final thing is relax. And I know that that's a big thing for me, not only finding ways to relax, but to relax into the process. Again, that this takes practice. It's not going to, to happen overnight. Do you have any thoughts on how ways women can relax or things that uh, you would think would be helpful? Yeah, the reason that relax is in there is because it ties back into the business of you want your heart to, to repair and it will repair on its own without much in the way of you doing anything other than getting obstacles out of the way. So I've, I've said it probably three or four times and I want to say it again because this is an important point, ladies. Your broken heart will heal on its own if you keep the obstacles out of the way. And we talked about one huge obstacle, and that is your uh, toxic reactions. But we need to talk about the other thing that's going to get in the way of your heart healing organically. And that is you stand up tight, not only with him, but in, other mul but in multiple mu domains of your life. So you can't try to heal your broken heart and be under chronic low-grade stress. The, those two are incompatible. You'll take three steps forward 
then you'll have a rough time somewhere uh, that may be totally unrelated to him. You'll take three steps back. Now you got to start this whole healing process over again. So we have to stop that. And we want to stop that by uh, learning to relax. There's multiple ways to do this. Biofeedback, deep breathing, meditation, movement, fun activities, finding uh, outside moral support. And that's one of the things that you're providing here, uh, Margo. Vacation time, doing things with your friends that may have nothing to do with him. Maybe have a ladies' night where you guys go play cards and drink gin for all I care. So there's, there's just a ton of different ways to keep that amygdala, which is the fight or flight response of the brain, keep it toned down a little bit so that you're not so much uptight all the time. If you've lived under the pressure of a neurodiverse marriage, it's very possible that you have been under chronic low-grade anxiety all year around. And it's making you mentally sick and physically sick. We have to stop that. So uh, everybody knows the things to do to relax. And everybody has their own pet methods. But they don't do it. Oh, it's too simple. I don't have time. No, it is simple. Sometimes the simplest stuff is the best stuff. And you're either going to have to make time to relax or you're going to have to make time. <clears throat> or you're going to have to make time to uh, go to the hospital <laughs> or the mental health professional, or to the doctor to be prescribed medication for depression. So you're gonna be making time one way or the other. I would choose to make my time, so with a self-help strategy, I'm gonna practice relaxation methods in some shape, form, or fashion every day, several times a day, so that I don't wait till things get so bad with me mentally and physically that now I have to do something. Let's do something now while it's still a choice. Yes, you can either make time in sickness or you can make time in health. And I can tell you that making the time in health is, is a much better way to go. And one of the simple things you can do is, I know, is to get a good night's sleep. I know that's made all the difference is going to bed on time, get, removing the um, uh, media, not being on social media before I go to bed and removing all of that and just working on, if you work on one thing, work on your sleep and then you'll get up rested, relaxed and able to, to face the day because it's so true what you said, the anxiety, there's, when there's a low level anxiety, um, it's just, it's not healthy. And that's what contributes to uh, autoimmune diseases, um, uh, being, you know, catching colds easily, depression, all of that, because it's, it's a drip, drip. It's like the frog in the uh, boiling in the pot, you know, it's, it's just slowly boils. And then pretty soon you, you end up being sick or, or um, depressed and, and not healthy. So, but I, I would like to say that, again, this doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. And I think that we have to, to ease into that. We have to be kind to ourselves. We have to treat ourselves with compassion and kindness like we would another person. You know, we're very kind people. And, and a friend, we wouldn't treat as hard, on, you know, we wouldn't be as hard on them as we are on ourselves. So I think self-compassion and realizing that this is a process. And I think it's important to work on your healing because then you're going to get stronger and you can make a decision. Maybe you don't want to stay in the marriage. Maybe you want to leave the marriage. Maybe you can, can say to yourself, I can make this work. But either way, you're not going to be able to do that if you're at an, such an emotional and physical deficit that you can't think straight. You're not in a position to make good decisions. So whether you decide to leave or whether you decide to stay, it's still your responsibility for your healing, for you to, to take the steps pro, take the steps forward. And it isn't easy. I mean, it, it's just not easy to do the work and to, to dig deep. Yeah, and so to, to your point, Margo, uh, when you get in this business of healing, you're just gonna have to knuckle down and know that this is gonna be, I'm gonna have to do this for the long haul. And this is gonna have to be a lifelong process. Um, Similar to uh, wanting to get in shape, you don't go to the gym for three months and go, oh, well, I finally lost some fat and gained some muscle. I'm good to go. And then you just go back to where you were again. No, you have to view uh, 
going to the gym and eating properly uh, as a lifelong, as, as a lifestyle. And so this business of staying, staying in recovery is a lifestyle. It's not a once you, you, you never arrive, Margaret, right? You just never arrive. You're always a work in progress and you got to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. I do have one more thought about that. When we get started and we, on our recovery and on our healing, we may get pushback from our husband. They may feel like, what's going on here? Something's changed. I'm, I'm being neglected. And they may have some kind of feeling about that. What are, what are your thoughts that women need to tell themselves to keep going? Well, they will get pushback uh, the vast majority of the time. So when she starts taking care of her and starts doing things without him and spending more time with her healing process, it's very common for him to feel like he's being abandoned. And it's not uncommon for people on, for men on the autism spectrum to fear abandonment anyway. So when she stops, uh, let's just say for, to be a little sarcastic here that she was doing too much mothering and taking on too much responsibility and trying too hard. And now she starts backing off. He may download that as she's getting ready to divorce me or she's threatening to separate or she doesn't love me anymore, or she, maybe she has somebody else. Maybe she's cheating. So just ladies expect for your husband to be very, uh, this, this, we'll just call it fearful. He's going to be very fearful that you're in the process of leaving him and he fears abandonment. So you can just say, you know, Margot, can we use your husband's name as, as an example here? Yes. So uh, Margot could say to Jeff, if Jeff was getting worried that Margot's going to abandon him, Margot could say, Jeff, this is a pro Margo thing, not an anti Jeff thing. This is for me. It's not against you. I'm not planning separation or divorce. This is not about abandonment. I still have the same, you know, I still have love, compassion, grace, and mercy. All that stuff is still in place. It's just that I'm uh, paying more attention to what I need right now. And that doesn't mean that I'm excluding you. So be sure to let, let him know, ladies, that uh, you're taking care of you is not the same thing as you abandoning him. Exactly. That's very good words. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I think this was a great conversation. And this is a very complex you know, subject. And healing is definitely a journey. Can you tell your audience, I know that you have workshops and you do um, work with uh, couples. Can you tell them how to find you? Yeah, um, they can just email me, which um, my email address is mbhutton at gmail.com. That's mbhutton at gmail.com. And also, uh, if they would just do a Google search for maybe a keyword phrase would be Mark Hutton on YouTube. That's not the URL, but if you did Mark Cutting on YouTube, I'm sure uh, suggestions would come up and then you can get to my YouTube channel, which I have hundreds and hundreds of videos over there. And uh, if, if people find a video that they need some clarification on, they can comment below the video and I'll be glad to respond. And if you would like more support from other Cassandra women and be part of a thriving community, go to healingcassandra.com and subscribe and You'll be kept abreast of the events going on, newsletter, and we'll send you a bundle of healing joy every month. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it.